All right, today's topic is public key cryptography. Uh, it is one of the foundations of network security. Actually, this is how we started to have uh, secure communication on the internet. So let me give you a little bit of uh, history. So uh, actually the classical ciphers or ancient ciphers were all symmetric key cryptography algorithms because we use the same secret key material for encryption and decryption. Then the invention of public key cryptography actually allowed uh, to people or a device to communicate on an insecure channel uh, in a secure way. So you can either perform encryption or you, you can do key exchange and so on. So let's start with the Diffie-Hellman. So idea of public key cryptography is first introduced by Diffie and Hellman in 1976. Also, they based their work on Merkel. So actually, we can count these three names. It is based on using a trapdoor function fp equals to c. So let's talk about how this works. So first thing about one-way functions. So hash functions are one-way functions. So in one-way functions, we have fx where you have the x. It is easy to compute fx, which equals to some value y. But it is hard to invert y, uh, f, sorry. So if you are given y here, it should be hard to find x. Recall that this is how we define pre-image resistance in hash functions. So. Public key cryptography uses a similar function, but this time they call it a trapdoor function. It is again easy to compute the output, and it is hard to invert f without extra knowledge. But if you have the extra knowledge, it is easy to find the inverse of f. And this is called the trapdoor. So this is why uh, we call it a trapdoor function. So Diff and Hellman introduced this idea, but so they also said that this way we can actually perform encryption and decryption. But they didn't provide they didn't provide any uh, encryption algorithm. Instead, they provided a key exchange algorithm, which is commonly referred as Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And actually, uh, most of our security relies on this key exchange. So, in 2015, which is actually late, but still, they received an ACM Turing Award. Okay. Very fundamental. So we have to actually uh, know how it works. So public key cryptography actually solves, uh, I mean, solves three main problems. So one is confidential message transmission, so encryption and decryption. Here we will talk about RSA and Algamon. Authentication, this is done by digital signatures. And again, we will talk about digital signature algorithm and elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. But there are many variants and many different signature algorithms, action or signatures. And so third, key exchange, exchanging the key of a symmetric key crypto system to an unsecured channel. So this is actually what Diff and Hellman proposed. Before understanding how this algorithm works, let's talk about some concepts. So I will actually uh, just read the definitions just to give an idea. Some algorithms are polynomial time algorithms. So an algorithm to perform a computation is said to be polynomial time algorithm. If there exists an integer d such that the number of bit operations required to perform the algorithm with a k bit input is with a big O notation k to the d. So this actually means that these algorithms are fast. Our computers are uh, good enough to perform these operations when uh, k increases. Okay. But exponential time algorithms take uh, too much time, let's say. So an exponential time algorithm has an estimate of O e to the c k, where k is the total input length and c a constant. So here e is the Euler's constant, but it can be two or three, so it doesn't matter. That here the problem is that you have the exponentiation here. Okay, so this is why uh, when k increases, this number increases in an exponential way. So let me give a, a brief example. So uh, factorization is a hard problem. So the question is finding a non-trivial factor of an odd integer n by trial division. Here, I want you to find the uh, factorization of an odd integer n. You can either say, I couldn't factorize it because it is a prime number, or you can factorize and say that n is the multiplication of these numbers. So easiest thing to do is just uh, trial division. Just try one by one. So ID is as follows. 
try all integers in the range. Here, of course, you try odd integers since the number is also odd, starting from three to square root of n. Because if n has a divisor, it has to be inside the sets. Because if you cannot find any divisor until square root of n, there cannot be anything larger than square root of n, but then divides n. Because then the uh, division would be inside this boundary. So you can try with 3 and check if 3 divides n. If it doesn't, you try 5. If it doesn't, you try 7, 9, 11, and so on. So this approach, we will show that this has exponential time complexity. So let's say that n is k bit integer. So logarithm base 2 of n is equals to k. So how many trials are we are going to do? Actually, we are going to perform square root of n over two many trials. But of course, we will use big O notation. So this division by two has no importance here. And square root of n is something like two to the k over two, since n is k bit integer. Okay. And uh, I haven't said this before, but this is uh, non fact division of a k bit integer with a k over two bit integer is of big O notation k square because you have to perform operation on every bit. So this is why it is k square. So a division requires k square operations. You are going to perform this many divisions. As you can see, this part is polynomial k square, but this part is exponential. So here we are saying that this solution is an exponential time algorithm. So it's uh, it will take time. So you can actually uh, design a, a cryptographic algorithm or a trapdoor function where you know multiplication is easy, but division is hard. That right? this is the main idea. But just by looking at this solution, you, we cannot say that this problem is an exponential time. Uh, I mean, this problem require. We cannot say that this problem requires exponential time solution because this is one of the solutions. If we can come up with a better solution, for instance, polynomial time solution, then we will say that this problem is easy. Okay? And the fact is that we don't have any polynomial time solution to this problem, but we have sub-exponential time solution, which is between polynomial and exponential time. So let me just give you the definition. So actually, it is sub-exponential time algorithm is something in this form but it has a parameter gamma. So let me actually show you this. If gamma is one, there are some cancellations here. So you end up with an exponential time complexity. If gamma is zero, again, there are some cancellations and you end up with K to the C. So it becomes polynomial time. So when gamma is close to zero, your algorithm becomes fast. If it becomes close to one, it becomes slower. So this is a parameter that gives you an algorithm between polynomial time and exponential time. I'm saying this because we have sub-exponential time algorithms for factorization. This is why we are going to need large RSA secret keys. Okay, This is the main reason. Because RSA, we rely on factorization. We are going to see it. And we are, we are going to say that you should choose a 3072-bit uh, secret key. Okay, but when we are going to talk about elliptic curves, we, 256 bit secret keys will be enough. This is the main difference. Okay, here you have a sub exponential time solution. So, before uh, defining the Hellman key exchange, uh, because when I start defining the Hellman key exchange, I will say let G be a group. So, in order to do that, let me remind you what an algebraic group is. A group G in algebra is a set of elements together with a binary operation, let's say star on G, that combines two elements in G and form a third element in G, satisfying the following group axioms. Here we have associativity, so parentheses actually doesn't change the solution. Identity element, this means that there's an identity element E such that whenever you perform operation with this element, the other input is the result. And every element has an inverse. So if you can come up with a set of elements and an operation like addition, multiplication, then we, which satisfies these properties, we say that that set of elements together with this operation is a group. So let me show you some examples. Integers with respect to the operation addition is a group. 
because there's associativity, you can just get rid of the parentheses. We have an identity element zero. So a plus zero where a is an integer always is a, right? And there's an inverse element. For instance, if a is an integer, then minus a is the inverse of it because when you perform the group operation, you end up with the identity element. So these are the basic definitions. So let me show you what is not a group. For instance, Z star where I simply remove zero uh, with respect to multiplication is not a group. So associativity, yes, we can get rid of the parentheses. Identity element, yes, there is one as the identity element. You multiply an integer aside from zero and you end up with the same integer. But the problem is that we don't have the inverse element because for instance, if A is three, we cannot find an integer where I multiply three with that integer, so that result is the identity. Okay? So this is the group. So as you can guess, if we think about rational numbers, this turns into a group because all of these definitions are all are the same, but now we have one over a inside this set. So this is why this is a group. Of course, these are infinite uh, groups because it has infinitely many elements, right? So since we are going to represent digital data as group elements, we mostly focus on finite groups in cryptography instead of infinite groups. So let me show you an example, Z4 with respect to addition. So when we say Z4, we have elements 0, 1, 2, 3. So we are going to perform this addition on modulo 4. So we have addition because this equals to this in modulo 4. There's identity element 0. And every element has an inverse. For instance, one has inverse three. This is important. People still think that we are still dealing with uh, real numbers. So they think that the inverse of one is minus one. Or when we have multiplication, they think that this is one over, uh, sorry, for two, we have one over two and that kind of stuff. But actually, when we re uh, restrict ourselves to the group elements, all elements has to be inside this group. So this is why. I add three to one and end up with the identity element, you know, two plus two again, identity element and three plus one is the identity element. So let me also show you an uh, Z4 star with respect to multiplication. This is not a group because two has doesn't have an inverse. So multiply two with every element in this set, as you can see, it doesn't give you one. So it doesn't have an inverse. So this is not a group. Also, in order to be a group, uh, this number actually should be relatively prime to this number. So easiest thing to create a group is to choose this number, prime number here, where every element will have an inverse. So this is why ZP star where P is a prime number with respect to multiplication is a group. Actually, it is also a field. So this is the actual elements generally we use in cryptography. It satisfies associativity. We have the identity element, and every element has an inverse with respect to this observation action. All right. With these definitions, let me also talk about the generator of a group. So small g is called the generator of the group g if every other element of the group may be obtained by repeatedly applying the group operation on g. So if it is addition, you add g to itself, and obtain all of the other elements, or if it's multiplication, you multiply G with itself. So each element can be written as a power of G in multiplicative notation. Each element can be written as a multiple of G in additive notation. So I'm going to use the multiplicative notation to explain how Diffie-Hellman key exchange works. So let G be a group and small g its generator. Given A, it should be feasible to compute G to the A. And generally, it is. We can do that because group operation is generally easy, so we perform this. But given the output B, so now you know B and G, but you don't know A, it should be hard to find A. Okay. So this hardness actually depends on your choice of group. Okay. For instance, as a group G, if you choose real numbers, this is a very uh, easy to solve, right? Because you can perform. For instance, for B, just calculate logarithm of B to the base G and you end up with A. So that is called logarithm problem. Here we call it discrete logarithm problem because we are going to use uh, finite element groups or you know discrete groups. So let me show you what the problem is. So I choose an X 
and the prime number here. And G in this example is three. So I multiply three X many times with respect to modulo here, and this is the result. So I'm asking you what the X is. So you can try one by one, but if this number is really big, then you know, it will be exponentially hard for you. And in practice, we choose this number as, you know, 3072 bit number, and it should be prime. I deliberately chose a non prime number here. As you can see, it ends with five. So five can divide this number. In those scenarios, if you can factorize this, you can solve this problem in a very easy way. Because you find the x for every uh, divisor in this mode, then use Chinese remainder theorem to obtain the real x. So in this example, it was this. So it is not that hard to do it, but you have to, you can try one by one. So you know, it takes time. So in order to continue, you have to uh, accept that this is a hard problem, okay? Again, the hardness depends on the group. For instance, hardness, inter the, actually the scientific word here is interactability. Of the discrete logarithm problem depends on the group. For example, this discrete logarithm problem on an elliptic curve is actually harder than this one. This is why here we are going to deal with small numbers. Here we are going to use large numbers. Okay. So consider that P star given B and G, find A such that G to the A is equal to B modulo P. So this is uh, an example for discrete logarithm problem. Best known algorithms are sub exponential with respect to P. This is why we have to choose very large P. Here I choose a prime number. Again, the same problem and same solution. Okay, so if you choose elliptic curves, now the problem is different because now you have an elliptic curve E defined over a finite field FQ. Okay. You have a point on this elliptic curve and its order is N. This means that if you at this point itself N many times, you end up with the identity element. Okay. Now uh, you choose a secret integer D and at this point to itself D many times. And this will give you a point on the elliptic curve. Now I give you this resulting point, this point P, and I'm asking you what the D is. So here, this problem is harder. Of course, we haven't defined how you add a point to itself, and we will see it when we talk about elliptic curve cryptography. But this problem is harder than this one because here we have some exponential time solution to this because here we are using the relations between uh, numbers, prime numbers, and so on in the sub-exponential time algorithms. But here we are dealing with points on curves, OK? So there is, for instance, here we have some relation between numbers. For instance, 3 is smaller than 5, and so on, and they are small integers. But here there is no such concept because we are talking about points on a curve. Okay? So we will see how we can define a group on elliptic curves and then show you how we can actually perform Diffie-Hellman key exchange on elliptic curve points instead of uh, uh, groups like this, OK? So finally, discrete logarithm problem security. Polydraw algorithm cancel discrete logarithm in about square root of p times q over 2. So here, these constants are not that important. So this says that it's a square root of q. Here Q is the size of the group of the finite field. So as you can see, the security is halved here. Actually, because of this, when we want 128-bit security, in symmetric key cryptography, I tell you to use AES-128, right? But here, due to this algorithm, we say, if you are going to use elliptic curve cryptography, just double the size. This is why you they choose a 256-bit secret key, OK? But if you focus on discrete logarithm, so this is the discrete logarithm problem in any sense. If it is the group can be an elliptic curve, or it can be uh, ZP. But index calculus algorithm can solve the discrete logarithm problem on ZP with sub-exponentials and complexity. Index calculus algorithm uses relations between small primes, which is not applicable to elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem. Thus, using elliptic curves allows us to work on groups with smaller number of elements. This is why Bitcoin uses this, actually. Okay. So let me finish this part with Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Now we know what a group is. 
uh, what we do is as follows. So we choose some public parameters as the group G and its generator small g. So A and B want to communicate. So think about these two devices that are connected to internet. So you are want you want to visit a web page. You so you communicate with the server using TCP. Then you want to you know continue in an encrypted way. So you have to exchange some data, and the secret gives. Since you haven't communicated with the server in a secure way before, you didn't exchange any secret keys, right? So think about any e-commerce web page. You want to buy something, but you didn't pre-exchange any secret key. So this is what you do. So A can be you or the server, and B again the other person. So A picks a random number A, calculates G to the A, and sends it to B. B does the same thing, randomly generates a number B, and send, calculates G to the B, and sends it to A. Okay. Then A computes since it receives G to the B from B, and A is the number they chose randomly, they can calculate the A power of this received number. This ends up with G to the AB. And B also does the same thing. G to the A is the number they receive from A. Since B is the number they randomly generate, so they calculate the B power of this and end up with G to the AB. So they started communicating, and they ended up with the same number. Now, this can be like 3,000 bits, doesn't matter. You need AES 128 bit key. So you can say that let's use the first 128 bits as our AES secret key. Okay. So here I defined it in the general sense. I didn't say what the group is. So let me show it with a picture where we use now actually modular arithmetic. Okay. Here our group is ZP star. Right. So you choose a public parameter, G generator of the group. P determines the group actually because we had ZP elements here. So, and let's think about in the case of attacker. So attacker knows these parameters and they listen to communication, right? So recall, A randomly chooses a number, calculates G to the modulo P and says capital A and sends it to the B. Now, attacker also captures this value. So they also know capital A. But from this, uh, they cannot capture the small a because this would mean that they need to solve this grid logarithm problem, right? Because the attacker knows P, G, and capital A, so all that they need to calculate small a, which is solving the discrete logarithm problem. B does the same thing, B. So they send calculate this and send it to Alice. So Alice actually calculates the eight power of this received number. It ends up with T to the AB or BA, it doesn't matter. And Bob also does the same thing, calculates the beat power of the capital A, and they end up with the same secret key now. So the attacker captures capital A and capital B. So all they need to capture either small a or small b, which is equivalent to solving this grid logarithm problem. So this is why actually attacker who listens to the communication doesn't know your secret key. So this is actually how many devices on the internet exchange secret keys, okay? So this is a very fast method. After this key exchange, you can start using AES 256 or anything you want.